Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of People, Places, Planet Pod. My name is Lavinia Reynolds, and I'm a research associate here at ELI. So what do Raccoons, the Country Music Hall of Fame, and Vanderbilt University have in common? They're all active participants in reducing food waste in Nashville, Tennessee. According to the Natural Resources Defense Council, Americans waste up to 40% of their food. In Nashville, Tennessee, approximately one-third of food waste comes from households, one-third comes from restaurants and businesses, and the last third comes from other institutions, such as schools and universities. The Nashville Food Waste Initiative is a project of the Natural Resources Defense Council that aims to reduce food waste on a citywide scale. I'm here with Sam Koenig, a research associate here at ELI, as well as Linda Bregan, the project coordinator for the Nashville Food Waste Initiative, um, to talk about the strategies that institutions in Nashville are using to reduce their food waste. I should note that Linda wears many hats. She is a lecturer in law at Vanderbilt University and the director of the Center for State, Tribal, and Local Environmental Programs at the Environmental Law Institute. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's wonderful to be here. So can you start by telling me a little bit about the motivation for the Nashville Food Waste Initiative? Why do we care about food waste? Lavinia, as you mentioned, we waste up to 40% of our food in this country. And when we waste that much food, it has serious environmental, social justice, and cost implications. To start with the environmental implications, when we throw away all that food, we are essentially throwing away all of the natural resources that went to, into making that food. So roughly 20% of all fresh water in, used in our country uh, in agriculture is used to grow food that we don't eat. Similarly, roughly 20% of our cropland is used to grow food that we don't eat. 18% of our fertilizer, and that has its own environmental implications because it runs off of fields and, and, and causes nutrient pollution. But about 18% of our fertilizer is used to grow food that we don't eat. And the environmental implications from a climate change perspective are also um, really significant. Not only are the implications of all of the energy um, that goes into producing and distributing that food um, equal to about 37 million cars on the road each year. But unfortunately, most food waste, as I'll talk about, ends up in a landfill or incineration, but most of it in a landfill. And in a landfill, it's in anaerobic conditions. And so as it decays, it produces methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. So those are just some of the reasons that we care about about food waste from an environmental perspective, but there are also serious social justice concerns. At the same time that we're throwing away up to 40% of our food, we have 42 million Americans who are food insecure. In Nashville, we have over 100,000 people who are food insecure, and a quarter of them are children. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. And you know, NRDC estimates that if we could reduce the food waste just by 30%, we could essentially feed all food insecure Americans. Of course, there are huge logistical and other challenges, but it gives you a sense of the magnitude of the problem. And throwing away this much food costs a lot. Um, you know, if you just focus on the family, the average family of four, it costs about $1,800 a year. So for all of these reasons, we care very much about food waste. So why tackle food waste in cities and not at the state or federal level? Well, you know, cities are really on the front lines when it comes to food waste. First of all, they're responsible for the food insecure members of their community, right? So they're very interested in trying to get surplus food to people who need it. And cities are responsible for waste management. Um, about 20% of waste in landfills is typically food waste. And more and more cities are facing problems like Nashville, where our landfills are starting to fill up. Now Nashville's growing at an incredibly rapid rate, and as we grow, so does our food waste, um, and so does our waste generally. Um, so 
The other reason that localities care about this is many of them have taken pledges to try to uh, uh, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, climate mitigation. And as I mentioned, because food waste contributes to climate change, um, it's another reason. So our Nashville mayor, for example, has pledged to reduce the city's um, carbon footprint considerably. So this is an avenue for the mayor to help, um, help achieve the pledge. And why choose Nashville? Well, Natural Resources Defense Council um, chose Nashville in part because it's a mid-sized city in the southeast. Um, I write a column actually for the Environmental Forum, ELI's Policy Magazine, and my column uh, is about what's happening in the states and localities around the country. I could literally write every column about Seattle or Portland or Vermont or certain cities in California. And the problem is, is that those cities really aren't a model for mid-sized cities in the middle of the country. So part of the reason to pick Nashville is because if Nashville can address food waste, then similarly situated cities can. And in fact, you know, since we've started this project, we've gotten numerous inquiries from southern cities and midwestern cities who might not have even considered tackling the food waste problem um, until a similarly situated city decided to do so. Uh, and I think Nashville also is um, a very exciting city right now. It's growing. It's prosperous. There's just a tremendous amount of social capital. People really want to participate in helping people in their own communities. Um, to give you an example, when we first started this project, we did some convenings where we invited people to just come together and help us develop our really our strategy and our agenda uh, with respect to, to food waste. And at the first couple of meetings, we probably invited 50 people and 100 people showed up. Wow. There was just so much energy around this issue. So it really has been a wonderful city to work in. So what are some of the strategies that you've explored through the Nashville Food Waste Initiative? Well, you know, one of one of the first things that's very important is to make sure to build on the work that's already going on in Nashville. And there, you know, were, were some wonderful projects already underway. So, you know, the first thing we want to do is help elevate those projects. And then we also want to create new projects um, where they are needed. In looking at how to address food waste in Nashville, we look to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's food recovery hierarchy. And what that recovery hierarchy tells us is that we first First, want to reduce food waste to begin with. We want to prevent it from happening. And then next, you want to try, if you can't do that, if you can't prevent it from happening to begin with, you want to feed hungry people. And if you can't do that, you want to feed animals. And an example would be our, um, our outdoor theater and the stadium where our football team plays in Nashville um, are both donating some food scraps to an animal um, rehab center, wildlife uh, rehab center. And, you know, I asked them about that because I thought, hmm, I'm not sure what we're eating from the concession stand is something that a wild animal, you know, should eat if it would be healthy. And and uh, and one of uh, the, the person who was in charge of the donation said to me, oh, you wouldn't believe how much the raccoons love those hot dogs that we have <laughs> left over. Um, so, so you want to, you know, first prevent the waste from happening to begin with, then you want to feed hungry people, then animals, then you want to have it in some kind of industrial use. If not, for example, some used cooking oils can um, be converted and used for energy. Next would be composting. And even within composting, there's a hierarchy that I won't, won't go into, but the um, but um, after composting, the last thing is landfill and incineration. And as I mentioned, unfortunately, that's where about 95% of food waste is going. So we really, we have a lot of work to do, not just in Nashville, but but generally. Um, so one of the other things um, we did as we started our work in Nashville was try to get a baseline assessment of how much waste there was both in the residential sector and in the commercial sector. And the other thing that NRDC did was what we call a capacity analysis, which was trying to figure out how much food is out there that could be rescued that is not being rescued. And having that data was really helpful because it helped us try to figure out where we should be focusing our attention. And one of the things that Environmental Law Institute did was once we had those numbers, for example, once we knew how much food was out there that could possibly be rescued, we convened uh, stakeholders and, and 
we also did individual interviews and we did our own research to really try to understand what the barriers are because very little um, of the food that could be donated is being donated. And what we did was we convened people and we tried to identify these barriers and then go about tackling those barriers. So, you know, for example, the kinds of things that we learned were that people were afraid about liability. They thought if they donated food and someone got sick, that they could be held liable. So one of the things we're working on is educating people that there is a federal Good Samaritan law that protects them from liability, except in cases of gross negligence. And our lawyers out there know that that's a very high standard. I mean, it's essentially close to intentionally donating bad food. And in fact, many states have supplemental laws that offer even um, greater protection to individuals, uh, or sorry, not to individuals. So, some states protect individuals, but for the most part, it's, it's for businesses that donate to nonprofits. Another thing we learned was that they did not realize there was an enhanced federal tax deduction for donating food. So there is a financial incentive and reason to donate food, but most people were unaware of that. So we are working to educate them. And I, and I will talk a little bit about how we're doing that. And then, you know, not surprisingly, a huge barrier was logistics. Not having a place to store food late at night when it becomes available in most cases, you know, for restaurants, um, not knowing how to transport it, not knowing who to donate it to, not knowing how to package it. So we're working in Nashville on all of these um, issues right now. And for example, on the educational materials with respect to liability perfect, um, protection and the tax incentive, um, we uh, collaborated with the Metro Health Department. And Metro Health Department sent a brochure out to all of the restaurants and businesses that it regulates that basically said, you know what, it's really okay to do this, right? You don't have to worry about the health department being upset with you. It's really easy to do. You have liability protection, there are tax incentives, and here's just, you know, a reminder of the simple rules that you already follow for making sure that food is tempted at, at the correct level. So that's just an example of the kinds of things we're working on, but we also did some on the ground matchmaking in the sense of finding some of the larger generators of, um, of surplus food and matching them with nonprofits that could take that food. So for example, in the first year that the Country Music Hall of Fame, uh, which is a wonderful um, museum and music venue in Nashville that has a large catering operation and restaurants, in the first year that they donated food, they donated 14,000 pounds of food. Wow. The year before that 14,000 pounds was thrown away. So those are just some examples of the kinds of um, the kind of effort we're making with respect to rescue of prepared food as opposed to packaged or, or, or canned food. So Sam, I know you've been working on projects related to composting in Nashville. Can you talk a little bit about those? Definitely. And so uh, we do work on projects related to composting, but more more broadly, we like to think of it as food scrap recycling because it's not just composting, which is what you might be more familiar with, but also anaerobic digestion, which is uh, a much more industrialized process generally. And that only, not only produces a soil amendment, but also produces biogas that can be burned to provide energy. So we recently just published our landscape analysis of industrial, commercial, and institutional food scrap recycling in Nashville. And so that's building off findings from the uh, NRDC that of the approximately 180,000 tons of food waste uh, generated annually in Nashville, about 67% of that is from industrial, commercial, and institutional generators. That's the place where you can perhaps make the biggest impact on right. food waste. Not only because that's where so much of the food waste is coming from, and there's so much uh, room for improvement, but also because you can get the biggest impact for each generator. You know, if I decide to compost at home, great, but that's going to pale in comparison to if we get you know, a convention center in downtown Nashville to compost. And so what we did for that was we interviewed over 25 different stakeholders in Nashville. Those stakeholders are from a variety of different types of generators, uh, from state, regional, local uh, government agencies, from, from waste management companies and consultants, and from uh, interested, you know, advocates in the community. 
So this report looked at barriers and opportunities to expanding the food scrap recycling infrastructure in Nashville, as well as to expanding food scrap recycling practices. And so that's getting generators to recycle their food scraps. And so both of these pieces are super important. And uh, a number of interviewees spoke to this sort of chicken and egg problem where, you know, there's no reason for the infrastructure to grow without interested generators. But at the same time, if you have a more robust infrastructure, uh, it can make recycling services more affordable and more convenient to generators. In the course of this research, we came up with a a number of opportunities for expanding both the infrastructure and food scrap recycling practices in Nashville. And these range from broad sort of transformative policies, like a procurement policy in which either the state of Tennessee or the government of Nashville and Davidson County would require its agencies to use finished compost projects as a, finished compost products as a soil amendment in construction projects to uh, you know more minor easy changes to make such as increased publicization of the fact that the state waives its annual permit maintenance fee for waste processing facilities that recycle 75% or more of materials they receive. So that's basically all composting, uh, compost processing facilities. And that already exists. You wouldn't, it wouldn't require any additional money to be allotted to it. It's just a matter of publicizing it more. Uh, and then, you know, we also found that on the generator side, the biggest problem, the biggest barrier we found was that most generators, you know, people working in these, uh, for these businesses, don't fully recognize either how big a problem food waste is or how big a part of the solution food scrap recycling is. You know, they know that donation is important and there's sort of an immediate reaction that they get when they, you know, donate a tray of food to someone in need. Um, but there's not that, that same sort of reaction to, to composting. They don't see why it's valuable. So uh, the biggest opportunity that we found through our research was uh, the potential for increased food scrap recycling education, whether that's through curricula in the public schools and, you know, the kids then bring this stuff home and talk about it with their families and just build awareness in general, or through whether that's, you know, hands-on training on how to compost and why you should. As I just mentioned, we, you know, just just published this report and uh, it can be found along with an executive summary and all of our other reports on the partner resources section of ELI's Food Waste Initiative webpage. Um, And moving forward, we're hosting a convening where we're bringing together stakeholders uh, from the community to talk about these recommendations and, you know, what are some actionable next steps that we can take and how can we capitalize on this momentum to increase the amount of food scraps being recycled in Nashville. So now that you've started these projects in Nashville, what's next? Well, you know, it's interesting because when this project started the pilot, we thought it would be maybe a one or possibly two year uh, pilot, but it really gained so much momentum and we were learning so much about what works and what doesn't work at the local level that we're now in our fourth year. But truly, the pilot is winding down this year. So one of the things that we are most focused on is how to ensure that the momentum continues and how to entrench capacity in the community community uh, to continue moving the ball forward both on, on well on prevention on rescue and on on recycling so one of the things that we will be spending a fair amount of time on this year is packaging success stories and lessons learned so that they can be used by other cities who want to try to replicate and benefit from the work that we've done here and The other thing that we're doing is transitioning a lot of the work we've been doing to the Urban Green Lab, which is a local Nashville nonprofit. Um, And Urban Green Lab has worked on food waste in different ways and really is just very well positioned to take this over. Um, As the name indicates, they literally have a lab, um, but it's mobile. And it is a trailer, essentially, that has exhibits about sustainability in it, including food waste. And they take this, these this mobile lab around to schools throughout Nashville, but they also develop curricula for teachers on sustainability, including on food waste. And in addition to that, they convene roundtables, corporate roundtables on different topics. And that is basically the green teams from various businesses in Nashville getting together and learning from each other. And they've done several of these on food waste. So they're really well positioned to take this over. And we're really excited that they were interested in doing that. Um, In addition, you know, we're working a lot with the local government, um, with, with Metro Nashville, and including, you know, with the state and the business community, all in ways that projects can continue. And 
An example I'd like to use is the mayor's challenge to the hospitality sector to reduce its food waste. This was originally a pilot project launched by our prior mayor uh, where for 30 days, restaurants were asked, just restaurants, were asked to reduce their food waste. So James Beard Foundation convened chefs to talk about food waste. And when we were there, we asked them, well, you know, what should a challenge look like? You know, a challenge that's issued to the industry. And they said, you know, chefs are really overwhelmed. They're incredibly busy. They're working under, you know, incredibly tight timeframes. This just simply can't be too arduous to do. And so what we came up with was a list of options. And what restaurants agreed to do was for 30 days to implement five measures to reduce food waste. And it could be anything from simply asking um, customers whether they wanted bread before they put it on the table to offering to go packaging, hopefully sustainable packaging um, for leftover food to you know more major efforts like composting their food scraps. Well, that um, challenge, which went for 30 days, was so successful that the industry trade associations came forward, the National Restaurant Association's local chapter, Nashville Originals, which is a group of, um, of independent restaurants and they said you know what this issue really resonates with our members we want this to continue and we want to take ownership in it and that's exactly what we are hoping to do in Nashville with this pilot which is to excite people to create momentum so Recently, last November, the new mayor issued a uh, ongoing challenge, uh, broadened it to the hospitality sector, and issued it in collaboration not only with the National Food Waste Initiative, but with the trade associations for the hospitality sector and the restaurant sector. So that's now an ongoing program. Um, and again, when you uh, when a restaurant agrees to participate, or a hotel or a a, a, um, a venue agrees to participate, um, they are going to adopt five measures to address food waste of their choosing and they're going to report every six months on what they're doing um, and they get a nice decal that goes in their window which is another way of communicating to the public that um, that this is an important issue that the mayor and that restaurants and others in the community are paying attention to. You know, something that um, was very exciting that happened during the course of this pilot project was in part through National Food Waste Initiative's input, the city decided to set a goal of reaching zero waste. Not in a specific time frame, you know, it could take 30 years, um, but, you know, really um, a very exciting goal to set. Um, and it joins a handful of cities around the country that are setting these zero waste goals. And so they are going to be releasing a draft plan for how the city hopes to achieve zero waste. And that's, of course, very exciting exciting from a food waste perspective, because as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, roughly 20% on average of um, waste in landfills is food waste. So if you're going to get to zero waste, you're going to have to address in various ways um, food waste. Um, so that's another example of something that is now gotten momentum in the community and is going to continue well beyond this pilot project. Well, honestly, I'm incredibly impressed with the successes of these projects, and I'm excited to see how um, the Nashville community sustains this momentum. Um, you mentioned packaging successes, success stories, um, and lessons learned. What are some of the things that you've learned from this initiative that can be passed on to other small to medium-sized cities like Nashville? I think, you know, big picture, I have been, first of all, incredibly impressed by how individuals can make a difference. And I don't just mean individuals in their own homes, which in aggregate, if everyone you know, starts paying more attention to food waste, that could have a huge impact. But I mean individuals as well that um, are in various businesses, right? And it doesn't need to be the CEO, sometime it is, but a lot of times it's a assistant facilities manager who decides we are going to compost or we are going to donate food. And so, you know, one of the things that to me is really inspirational is how many individuals in Nashville in these businesses have just 
said, we're going to, we're going to just do this. Um, and so I just, I encourage people um, in other cities, you know, even if you're low in the hierarchy in your business or in your city government, you truly, truly can make a difference. Um, the other thing that I think in these times of um, tremendous polarization and partisanship, food waste is a wonderful issue to work on. Because even if you don't care as much about the environmental implications, um, if you don't want to even talk about climate change, this is an issue that resonates with almost everybody in some way. Because instinctively, I think we all feel that throwing away so much food just doesn't make sense when we have people in our own communities who don't necessarily know where their next meal is coming from. So I'm actually very optimistic. I mean, one of my personal takeaways is just to, because individuals can make a difference, because it doesn't always have to be polarized and political, that this issue of addressing food waste has a lot of traction. And I fully expect that cities are going to look to Nashville and look to other cities that are taking the lead and and follow. So I guess the other thing, you know, I would just like to mention is that Natural Resources Defense Council, which is um, which is you know sponsoring this pilot project also has a much broader program now um, called Food Matters Initiative and the whole point of that initiative is to help cities implement food waste solutions so that's going to is a tremendous resource for cities around the country not only the lessons learned in Nashville specifically but um, the other the other cities that they're working with. Thank you so much for your time today, Sam and Linda. This is really a cutting edge initiative and I'm excited to follow the successes of the Nashville Food Waste Initiative over the next few months. Thank you so much for having us, Lavinia. It's really exciting to be here and to get a chance to talk about all the great work that we're doing. Thank you, Lavinia. Appreciated talking with you. To our listeners, if you would like more information about how to tackle food waste in your homes, neighborhoods, and cities, you can follow at Nash Food Waste on Twitter. Thanks again to Linda Bregan, Sam Koenig, and to our podcast production team. Um, Look out for our next episode on corporate renewable energy procurement, which is coming soon. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet Pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you, so please send us your questions, comments, and ideas to podcast at ELI.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.